Welcome to Immersed. Immersed is a series around music, health, wellness, and technology. Each episode, we bring together a diverse array of perspectives to explore how music and sound can improve our lives. Immersed is brought to you by Studio Feed. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the show. Blessings, everyone. Welcome to Project Immersed. My name is Tyler Simone. I'm going to be your host for a very, very special episode that we have planned for you guys. Um, we are joined by an absolute legend, um, in my opinion. He is a Grammy Award winning audio engineer, best known for his longtime collaborative work with one of the greatest rappers to ever live, Jay Z. He's also a DJ, an educator, record executive. Um, and we're happy to have him. So welcome, young guru. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yes, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to dive into, but I guess to maybe level set the conversation for maybe some of those who are not as familiar with you, um, just would love to give them an opportunity to hear your background, kind of where you came from, how you got to where you are today as young guru. Um, I'm from Wilmington, Delaware, I'm 48 years old, born in 1974. Um, this was into music uh, as a kid. Also was very like a technical person. Um, engineering from the general sense has always been my love. Uh, I'm very much the kid that read a lot about engineering. I went to a program called FAME, um, which was formed for the advancement of minorities in engineering. Um, and just kind of got you know, my feet wet in all types of engineering, from civil engineering to just um, all, type, all types of engineering. And then obviously um, around high school time, um, personal computing became, you know, a thing. Uh, so that level of engineering as well, in terms of programming and using programs, and, um, you know, back then we were MS-DOS, <laughs> you know, like we were that old. Uh, so it, that's just been my whole life of um, combining music and engineering, um, DJ all throughout junior high school, high school, uh, all throughout college. I went to Howard University in uh, 1992. Um, went there, um, you know, with a plan to become a DJ um, on the scene in DC, successfully did that. Uh, while I was there, like most people, you form a crew, you make music, you, you know, create beats. Um, and try to become successful in the music business. So uh, 1996, uh, ended up being the tour DJ for Nashua. She had a song called Five O'Clock in the Morning, um, which was a huge hit. Uh, 97, my crew actually um, got some success with Tracy Lee. So he had a song called His Party Time, um, The Theme. Um, we were surrounded by a lot of what would be the foundation of the bad boy camp. So um, Derek Angeletti, uh, Chucky Thompson, who my direct mentor, may he rest in peace, uh, those people, Ron Lawrence, uh, we were just there on that scene. Um, Mark Pitts, uh, who ended up managing Big, was who actually gave Tracy Lee his deal. He started a company um, and we were just around it. So, you know, taking all of that information, going on tour with Nan, Coming home, uh, I went to Omega Recording Studios. That was my, um, that's where I, I was officially trained um, and went to class as an engineer. Um, and from there, just started working with Chucky and everything that Chucky was doing at Chuck Life. And in 99, I left uh, DC and went to New York to try my hand um, in New York City. So I ended up working for Derek at Crazy Cat, um, working on the Mad Rapper project all throughout 99. Um, got my feet wet, you know, by the time I'm done with that, like How to Rob by 50 Cent was on that album. Um, you know, Puffy, uh, Buster Rhymes, The Beat Nuts, um, Eminem, you know, a bunch of people were on that album. So that, and then just getting accustomed to sort of the scene in New York City, going to all the studios, meeting engineers, meeting assistants, seeing how the studio business ran in New York. Um, Floating from a bunch of studios, you know, Hit Factory, Sony, Sound on Sound, um, you name it, you know, I was there. So that was pretty much my story. Then at the end of the Mad Rapper album, um, I hooked up with my manager then, um, 
L'Oreal College, who basically catapulted me into doing a lot of independent engineering work. Um, she was very, very big on um, promoting young Black engineers and making sure they were getting paid the proper money. So she got me a, a session with Memphis Bleak. Um, Jay-Z came to check on Memphis Bleak, and that's sort of how the thing of, of myself and Rockefeller kind of sparked off. Uh, Baseline Studios was created. So we put everything together at one studio, um, and that's sort of where the, the legacy began. And I, I worked out of that studio for a very long time for at least a good 10 years of uh, mm -hmm. just constantly being in the same room, working with the crew. I'm still doing outside projects. I would mix outside you know, albums. People sometimes get that confused as well. I wasn't solely just Rockefeller, but I was responsible for um, a lot of what went on at Rockefeller uh, from Beanie Seagull to Memphis Bleak to the Young Guns to Freeway um, to, you know, eventually Cameron came over um, just everything that was going on in that studio. So that was sort of my my quick rundown of my history. Mm, his, it's historic. It's it's. I love that. I'm excited to to just learn a little bit more. I'm curious, where did the name Young Guru come from? How did that tie into the story? Um, this was a time. <laughs> Uh oh, I think we're frozen. Wait, I'm going to pause you because I think you froze and I don't want to miss what you said. Okay, I think we're back. So, yeah, we there back? we go. Are we back now? So, I don't think. Yeah, yeah this was the time when, yeah, when, when Tommy Hill figures were very popular uh, in hip hop. People like Grand Poo Bar wore them a lot in videos. Um, and I did not have the money for Tommy Hill figures. So, I ended up stealing some out of the mall and I got caught. So, what I was doing um, as part of my community service was um, teaching at this community center called People's Settlement. And I was teaching about African griots and gurus and things of that nature. Um, so I kind of just took the name from that because it fit, um, just in terms of who I wanted to be and, and um, just always a level of information. And um, I used to, I, and still do read a lot and, and just always loved to read and love information and love learning and just um, education. Uh, information was incredible to me. It was, it was very powerful to learn how to build something um, and create you know, with your own hands. And people use systems, but don't really know how they work. So I wanted to know the inner workings of all the systems that I was using, whether or not that was a bicycle or a VCR or you know, a mixing board. Um, I just wanted to know how it worked. Uh, I just have that, that thing. Of, I wanted to take a watch apart and look at it. You know, I marvel at watches and things that are really well designed. Like I, for my students, I use a watch as a perfect example of engineering where there's a lot going on under the hood of years and being able to do that, but it's very simple for the user. All they have to know how to do is look at the big hand, the little hand, and it's an effective tool for telling time. You know, so that's like the premier thing of, of engineering. Um, it can be a complicated system, but if it's, if it's simple for the user, then to me, you've done your job. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I love that. And you know, something I I really admire about, at least from what I've seen of you speaking and teaching others about whether it's mix engineering or, or sound in that way. I really appreciate how you not only teach the technicality of audio engineering, but also you enrich people with like an understanding of the power of sound and and what's really happening with the power of sound. And um, I know you use the, the term Nada Brahma um, as well. That's a term that I bring with me through life as well. All is sound, God is sound, mm -hmm. um, all is vibration. I hear you teaching your students about, I think I was listening to something where you talked about even just sitting at the mixing board and, and breathing and how that's cyclical and how that ties into music. Where did you where did you learn like where did all of that wisdom come from and and I just yeah I want to give you a chance to speak on it and what all of that means to you. Um, I guess it just comes from how do I put it you know when when you're sort of twelve me when I was twelve thirteen searching for um, understanding of different um, spiritual traditions different information that I was trying to digest and sort of understand because it was coming from a whole lot of different places. And it, it's really beautiful because it it is kind of founded in the music, in hip hop, of, of what was being talked about at that time. So if you remember like 
in 89, you know, 88, it was a huge movement. You know, I'm 14, 15 years old. And just the music itself, it was a huge just um, push of, of information and learning. And there's KRS-One and there's Poor Righteous Teachers and there's X-Clan and there's, you know, all these different viewpoints. So my thing was just to go research a lot of things and, and find out where information comes from. And I think people um, sometimes just accept things without really truly understanding what they are. So that's that's where it started. That's where the, the, the journey starts. And, and you just continuously learn and you, um, you know, apply that to daily life or just when you're learning, you know, about frequencies and it goes, okay, well, the human being can hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And then in your mind, you're like, okay, well, what's below 20 hertz or what's above 20,000 hertz or um, understanding exactly what we mean when we say frequency and frequency of what, on what medium, you know, because if we're talking about frequency of sound, then that's an interaction with sound pressure and, and our ears and, and, and what, how we hear and how, you know, our ears are really transducers and um, we get sound pressure and it hits our eardrum, but then it's transferred um, into energy, you know, into a signal that goes to our brain, you know, so that's one form of frequency, or if we're talking about light frequency, you know, what, what exists outside of our sight, outside of the color spectrum, and then you get into microwaves, and, you know, on one end, the violets and the ultraviolets, and how those things can be used, and um, just things that are outside of our limitations as human beings. That's one of the beauties of technology, is that we can add on things that extend our senses, you know, things that are actually there, but we can't see them, we can't hear them, but we can prove that they're there. I can prove to you that a microwave exists because I can eat your food with it. I can prove to you that there's higher frequency because we use that for radio. You know, I can mm -hmm. prove to, like those things exist. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just, that's just what I was studying, things that were, um, sometimes people use words that, you know, scare other people, you know, like, oh, metaphysical. I'm like, what does that mean? It's like, okay, things that exist beyond just our physical existence or beyond what our senses can perceive. Um, that's, that's to answer your question in the long run, that's where it comes from. This, you know, understanding of, of, of not a bond, of the fact that without vibration, there is no existence. You know, everything has to move and vibrate, even solids. You know, that's a hard concept to get across to some people that don't you know, worship physics or understand physics the way that I do, but like even your solids have vibration or, or are vibrating at a certain thing or um, just the, the the beauty of understanding that, of understanding exactly what it is. So sort of like demystifies things so that you're not caught up in just rhetoric, but you're, you're understanding exactly what, you know, people meant when they were saying these things. You know, um, one of my biggest influence um, is, is Hazar Khan. So just his, his beautiful way of, of writing and, and explaining these concepts um, from, you know, I worship, right? I'm, I'm, I'm an audio guy, but I love great writing because it's something that I necessarily can't do. You know, well, not to say I can't write, but I'm not, I don't have the beautiful words that um, someone like him has, you know, because I, that's not my concentration. I just love reading those type of things. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's where a lot of it comes from in, in study and, and um, especially when you can merge the thing that you really love um, on that level. And, and mm -hmm. that's, that's where the not a problem, not a problem comes from. I love that. No, and I love that because I have so much respect for audio engineers because I feel like you guys are wizards, whether you know it or not, because mm -hmm. you understand sound in a way that like you said, we live in a vibratory universe. Everything is the result of vibration and movement. And when yes. you can, I feel like sound is like an avenue to help the average person understand that and understand how that works. Because it's, when you understand that, you understand energy and you understand life and you understand how like the underworkings of life work, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So it's really cool to hear just someone on your level, like, with that awareness and teaching the future generations, you know, I think that there's a bit of a responsibility of like when when creating music and creating sound, like knowing the power in that way. So um, on this series on Immerse, we talk a lot about the wellness implications of sound and how sound can be used to, you know, just optimize health. And um, I'm just curious, do you have any knowledge or any personal experience with that of like, 
I know we're living in a time where sound baths and sound healing is becoming more accepted. And um, so, yeah, I'm just curious if, of, of your thoughts on maybe like the merging of sound and wellness and where that's going. Yeah, I mean, sound can be used to heal. And that's, that's, a, that's a proven fact. Um, it's amazing to me that um, just people are just now accepting this. Um, but, you know, it's, it's been there for thousands and thousands of years of the healing power of sound, and knowing that we vibrate um, at a certain frequency. And I think sometimes th th there, there are tropes that come about because people are getting into it. You know, people have these things where they go, oh, we'll vibrate higher or this. You know, it's like, I understand what they mean, but you know, when you get really into it, it's it's like we vibrate at a very specific, each human being on this planet, each thing in this universe vibrates at a very specific rate. So aligning that and, and understanding um when people say, you know, the sound of the universe, that there are certain frequencies that are base frequencies for us, whether or not they're extended beyond, and when I say beyond, I mean both ways, like higher frequencies that are. When you say higher frequencies, you're really talking about how fast something moves. Um, mm. That's what the word frequency means, how frequent it comes. Um, but higher frequencies or lower frequencies, and sometimes having to have that respect for lower frequencies because people will place um, a positive or a negative onto those two words, and, and, and it really is neutral. It doesn't have a, a positive or negative connotation. Um, it's just the number that we've associated with or the language that we use to describe those things. And that's where you have to start in a basis with people with where someone will say, oh, well, what is a frequency? What is a hurt? You know, what, what hurts? And I'm like, it's just the language that we use to describe this phenomenon the same way someone in the English language said, okay, this is a cat or this is a dog. It's, it's just a basis of what we started with. And mm -hmm. you use that as, as an example. And of course, people are going to um, first dive into what they can physically see and measure and 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 that you're right, that understanding will allow you to understand things that you can't see and you can't physically measure. So using sound as healing is basically saying that there are sounds or there are frequencies that you can listen to, even if you, and, and listen to is, is, is a very subjective word because there's also frequencies that you can't hear that will also affect you. You know, um, you can't like exist in the microwave, you know, like sort of there are frequencies that can hurt you. There are things that, you know, um, you have to understand about the way that your body works, but you, and, you know, I'm very big on demystifying things. So when people are saying, oh, my higher chakras or my lower chakras, you know, and I have to remind them, well, don't disrespect the lower chakra and add something negative to it. If there was no lower chakra, there'd be no human race because the lower chakras are your sexual chakras. So if you're mature enough to understand that, you're going to say, okay, well, we do need those chakras and they have to be active or else we would not have more people. You know what I mean? So understanding mm -hmm. the higher chakras or, or being able to um, explain to people through like the flower of life and things of that nature, um, why these points are important and what they mean. And, you know, starting from a point and that point expanding and then um, as far as it can go, but that thing can't know itself yet. And so it has a relationship with something else. So you draw another, so, you know, you go to the, 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 the edge of that circle and you draw another circle and then there'll be a little um, thing that looks like an eye in the middle of it. And that basically is our representation of when light comes into existence, because now we have um, a reference point of now something can know itself. So it can, mm. it can compare itself. If you're in deep space and a complete void, and not even space, because space does have things in it. But if you, if you understand what we mean by void, um, there is no right or left, up or down. You can't fall. You can't move. Like a void is nothingness, right? So you'll have no relation. You can't see yourself. You can't, you can't understand anything around you. You need some type of comparison um, in order for you to even know of yourself. You can be conscious. You can be conscious, but not conscious of yourself. So mm -hmm. You know, there are very simple ways to draw these things and to explain it to people to say, okay, once we keep moving and we, you know, and we do that around, we have, you know, when I say around, like around that original circle, and we keep drawing those things, now we have these points that we can understand where we start to get um, shapes. You know, if you do it three times, then you'll get to 19 circles. And then if you do it another time, past those 19 circles, you'll start to get to the five um, founding um, forms in the universe, right? So mm. you'll get there's basically five basic forms that all things are made of in this universe that we live in. So a lot of times people will argue um, 
not argue, but point out things and try to sound deep and say, you know, our, our perception of, of modern day physics and, and especially now that we've gone beyond looking to the big size and we're sort of going in, inward now. So trying to figure out what, what quantum physics and quantum mechanics is and having this, trying to finish this theory of everything that Einstein was trying to work on um, where it's like there has to be, you know, a theory that covers everything because everything is in this universe and it exists. So it, it, there has to be something. Um, and, and us as scientists, physicists, as musicians, you know, we revel in the fact that we don't know everything. So we're trying to figure those out. But my, my point being was that people will say, oh, well, there's all these universes that can exist all at the same time. And I'm like, yeah, but we live in this one. So it will behoove you to sort of understand the rules of this one before trying to venture out into other ones. It sounds cool, you know, but it's it's really about learning human existence um, and learning um, who we are, what what makes us who we are, um, and and figuring out those what, what those rules are. And then, you know, there's always that axiom of um, as above, so below. You know, so it's it's just like we come to find out that those same rules that we apply on our level have to apply to the whole universe and what makes them, you know, what makes those rules exist and why they exist. And, you know, that, that's really what the whole study is about and, and, and doing that from a very practical level of um, just explaining it to people. And, and that's what, that's why teaching is so important because it makes you really, really, really understand your information and be able to explain that information to a bunch of different learning styles. Not everyone learns the same way. Not everyone has had these same experiences and not everyone can physically see something. So, um, you know, it's just it's just that. It's a study of life. And, and, and sometimes people will say things that to them seem uh, like super amazing. And this is like, I'm like, well, that kind of makes sense. You know, if somebody says, oh, there's UFOs. And I'm like, well, UFOs are unidentified flying objects. There's a lot of flying objects that I have no idea what it is. Whether that be the government testing something or whether that be what you're trying to say in terms of something coming from, you know, another planet. But if you if you study science and you study um, size, I think people don't have a, a real respect for size when we um, talk about our planet and our um, solar system and then our universe. And then you know, I don't think people really respect that. So there's there's no way that in the vastness of space and and, and how huge space is, it's almost unfathomable how big it is that we're the only sort of life that exists or these fantasies that have come about through, you know, um, science fiction that even something off of this planet would have a human form, you know, like life comes in all sorts of forms. So you have to remind people like, oh, but, you know, bacteria is life just because it doesn't have arms and legs and a tail or, you know, it's still life, it's living. You know, the plant is living and it communicates. It doesn't talk, but they, mm -hmm. but it does communicate, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Those sort of things um, are mixtures and, and, you know, obviously I tend to go a little bit more towards physics and to sound, but it all ties together through chemistry, biology, you know, all of those, the, the, the great sciences that we've developed and named. Um, and it's also our time period of, of uh, the way that we break those into sort of categories when before they weren't sort of broken into categories, everything was all together as one along with Mm -hmm. um, a moral aspect, you know, so it was all studied as, as one particular thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, there's so much of what you're saying. I'm just like getting chills and like wanting to dig deeper into even just the part about, you know, these, these principles apply on every level of life. Like, like you said, insects, you know, bacteria, like they may not be able to think and speak like us, but I feel like the the universal thread is feel and and sentience. They they can feel and they can influence their environment, and I feel like that's true on every level of, of existence. And that's partly why music and sound is so powerful because it communicates feel, you know. Um, but I, yeah, I, I know, love that. It's oh, it's, sorry, just, it's just our it's just our. I, I've thought about this a lot, and there's a there's a human perception has to do with size. So mm -hmm. meaning, you know, we sort of respect life based on size. And that sounds weird, but if you were, if you were to have an ant or a fly and someone was just a step on the ant or shoot a fly and just kill the fly, you know, that's normal for us. We look at that as just normal, like get this fly out of here. And I would ask like, what size does it matter? Because if you watch someone kill a dog, you'd be outraged, you know, mm -hmm. like, 
Mm -hmm. Like, whoa, you just killed this dog. It's light. You know, but at what size? Is it, is it like the ant size matters or does mm -hmm. it get to the size of like, say, a snail? Because we don't care about that. But if it gets to be a rabbit, we care about that. But then it's mm -hmm. acceptable for us to kill certain animals and not other animals. You know, so it's 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 really based off of size. Um, mm -hmm. Our perception is based off of size. So um, it's a really interesting topic when you talk about this thread of of life, and then it also um, brings me to a question of of is the universe um, a sanctioned thing? Like, does it does it think? Does it you know? Mm -hmm. And does thinking have to be in our format, the way that we mm -hmm. think, in order for it to be valid? So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it just depends on, on how you view things. Or there, there are points where we view ourselves as having free will and being able to do whatever it is that we want to do. But there are things that we don't know if the sun has free will, but we've never seen it not be a sun. You know, the mm -hmm. sun is going to always do what it does. It shines until the point where it can't shine any longer. And it, it then will go supernova. and become a planet you know like sort of thing mm -hmm. you just think about the number of, of um differences that we have based off of what our sort of social construct has, has taught us or values <clears throat> excuse me based mm -hmm. on where we sort of place things and, and how that's been passed down throughout the years and how that's changed um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no it's so true and i i i wanted to go back to a point that you made too just about frequencies because I feel like right now, I, I was really happy to hear you kind of demystify this high and low vibration, high frequency, low frequency. <laughs> it's the trendy thing now, but it's like, you know. It, it all I, becomes I, like slang. I'm sorry to interrupt you yeah. and ask the question. But it, what I do is I take it with a grain of salt. It, it becomes sort of like slang. It becomes this thing of where people are now experts in two seconds after watching like a 10 minute YouTube video. Um, you know, all those things. And it's not bad that people wanted to get into health and wellness and understanding, but there also comes these, like I said, these tropes that come along with it because of the fact that they'll vibrate higher. And I'm like, your body actually can't vibrate other than exactly what it's supposed to vibrate. But they, we understand what they need. Have mm -hmm. positive thoughts, you know, mm -hmm. um, removing negative thoughts. But there's also a thing of um, making people understand that there's always balance. That's the one thing that, that is proven in the universe, that there is a plus and a minus. And, and, it, and the plus and minus doesn't necessarily have to be good or bad. There's just always two sides to everything. You know, like that, that, that is the, the one thing that we can say in our universe, that there's always an opposite to everything that's there. Um, and the same thing with, with just the basis of, of how we exist. We have to, and I think you alluded to that earlier, because um, that's one of the lessons that I give to my students where there always has to be an out and an in. That's the way we breathe. We breathe, you know, we breathe in and we breathe out, breathe in, breathe out. There always has to be tension and release. There always has to be um, this movement. It's, it's literally the way a speaker moves of, of, of pushing, you know, air this way, and then it has to move back on the track in order to push air again, and move back on the track. You know, it's, it's, you see that in so many different things, but it's always there in that duality of, um, of our existence. So yeah, it, it is a demystifying thing, but I don't get upset about it. I understand that people are trying to get into it and learn and understand. It just becomes tropes that people use. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree 100%. Like it's, yeah, I think people, it's their way of seeking. And it's like, if that's what gets you in the door to learning this knowledge, then okay, you know? Mm -hmm. But I agree, I think when you were talking about the positive and negative and us living in like a dual universe, I think of like a battery. Like, I feel like the un there's the positive and the negative and it's like, you know, mm -hmm. we, we, we add the connotation of good and bad, but both are necessary in order for life to exist. And I put up so a, that, a post a while ago that said a completely positive battery does not work. If yeah, you have positive on both sides, the battery can't work. It doesn't flow yeah. energy. Energy has to mm -hmm. flow. You know, what I mean? like that's why we have, you know, assigned a positive or a negative charge to um, to to things of an atom. Right. So you have electrons, protons, neutrons, and we just we assigned a charge to them. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're good or bad. We just understand mm -hmm. like saying this is the positive charge, then this is the negative charge. And we just assigned it and we say that that's the way that energy flows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, exactly. And then that brings me to you, you. You spoke on this a little bit, but I want to spend a little more time on it. Just low frequency sound and bass, like 
I all we all love bass like that's well most people I I, I would assume love bass you know mm -hmm. we want to feel it you want to feel the music I like wish I could get in the subwoofer sometimes that's why I love my sub pack mm -hmm. um but it's like there's this connotation of the low frequency sound but I think low frequency especially bass and drums are some of the most powerful sounds we have access to and it's more about the intention that we put behind the sound or the words that go over the sound mm -hmm. that skews it to positive or negative negative. and I just mm -hmm. wanted to hear your thoughts a little bit more on that especially about yeah bass and the 808s and low frequency sound yeah I think what you're referring to um is one from a physics standpoint when you get into what we consider low frequency sound, because again, we only hear from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So when you're talking about those things that are around 30, 40, 50, 60, 80, we're really talking about waves that are like 20 feet long. So it's wrapping literally, that wave is literally wrapping around your body or has the potential mm. energy to sort of wrap around your body. It's also the thing that when we're in a room that is bouncing the most because it's the biggest wave. So mm. it's, it's that thing um, of the warmth. When we, when we try to describe sound sometimes, it's hard to use words um, in the English language to describe feeling sometimes, but mm. um, that thing that feels like it's so warm and it's wrapping around us, that's why we love it because the wave is so big. Mm. So that thing, is, it, and, and it has the potential to physically move us. When I say move, like the amount of sound pressure that it takes to create that wave is higher than the amount of sound pressure you know that it takes to create um, a higher frequency, even though those higher frequencies you know are more rapid. So that's why we'll get um, movement out of a you know sort of thing versus a boom you know and it's, and it's sort of um, allowing us to meditate a little bit more because it, it exists longer. Mm. So um, that's the beauty of in the power of low frequency and especially drum because it creates this rhythm. So the rhythm allows you to, it, it sort of tells you how to move, like literally how to move. It's, it's sort of, I find sometimes um, that I can't walk off beat. Like if I'm, if I'm listening <laughs> with headphones in, my pace of my walk sort of goes to the pace of the music. And it's hard for me to mm -hmm. literally like walk off beat. And I've mm -hmm. noticed that. And also it's, it's like, it, it, it creates our movement for us. So that's, mm -hmm. that's another just sort of gem that I give to you know, my students that, the low frequency is not about a connotation. It's not about one particular form of music. Um, we do have to be careful about the messaging that we give while we're listening to music because it is sort of a, a trance state. You know, we get in, in not a trance state in some weird way, but it's, it's, it's a way when we get into listening to music that we are um, engulfed in. And, and the messaging that comes on top of that then gets embedded in us and we remember these things. And, you know, we repeat them and, and, and it goes into our subconscious. And so you, you hit it on the head. It's more about understanding that what we're putting on top of that, or, or should I say combining with that, um, mm -hmm. that it, it really is powerful and that, the, you know, the air is sacred and, and the air waves are sacred just from that, mm -hmm. that simple, you know, that simple fact of, of you don't want to um, do something so sacred for something negative, you know, and, mm -hmm. You know, people have called it all different types of things all over the years. Some people say oh, I'm casting a spell or whatever it is. It's really just about using that energy to deliver a certain type of message. And and there's even instances where the message doesn't have vocals attached to it. You know, if mm -hmm. you're, you're listening to jazz, there, there may not be, but you're getting a message and having a full conversation without words. Um, mm -hmm. And then sometimes there, you know, there's there, I've, I've had just the soul experience of traveling around the world playing music and being in rooms where people don't even speak English, but they know your songs and can recite your songs. And people are like, oh, well, how can people that, you know, are in Russia that don't speak English? And I'm like, well, you listen to reggae music and dance hall and you have no clue of what this person is saying, but you like this, this record. You know, I have plenty of friends that listen and don't understand Patois, you know, fully, you know, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's like people will start to learn Patois through listening to dance hall, the same way that people will learn English by listening to certain songs, and not just rap music, just all music. People will mm -hmm. learn different language and communication because they're repeating something and then they figure out what it means. So there is a real power in that. It's, it's literally the reason why we set the alphabet to rhyme mm -hmm. and into a song to teach it to our kids. You know, we, we created the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 
a challenge is that we made a song so that kids can remember what this is. You know, like mm-hmm. that's the power of rhyme and the power of music and the power of repetition. And, you know, um, we use it as a teaching tool. Mm-hmm. Mm, I love that. It's so true. I, I have a quote that I'll, I say that's, that says that the music we listen to becomes the mantras that we repeat in our mind. And it's like, that that's like you said, it's the power of music. It's the power of repetition and rhythm. And, it's, and the more words you have, and you know, that, that's one of the things in, in um, that's a hard concept to get across sort of in a metaphysical sense is that you think in your language. Um, mm. so you think in words. So the more words you have, the better you, you can express yourself or the better you can think. Mm-hmm. Um, because if you if you if you're not learning new words or or if you're even not understanding fully a lot, what I see is a lot of people use words incorrectly and not really understand their true meaning. And then that means your thinking is wrong because mm-hmm. you have to think in your language. And I've, all, mm-hmm. I've, I've often asked um, a lot of my, my European friends, um, you know, know multiple languages. And mm-hmm. just because the countries are so close and people are so used to that and the school system because of that has developed and said, oh, it's important for us to teach multiple languages. A lot of my friends speak four or five different languages where I was like, oh, I'm sort of jealous of that because us in the United States, we, it's just like an elective, you know what I mean? Like, well, we learn mm-hmm. some broke down version of, of it uh, because we're listening to sort of slang in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So the Spanish that I hear in the Bronx, you know, it, it might be called Spanglish, you know, because mm-hmm. it's not like a technical way of speaking Spanish. Or, you know, if you wanted to take French as an elective, that was your choice. Whereas in other countries, it's not really a choice. So I often ask them, what language do you think in? And that's your base, mm-hmm. you know, your base language. Or when people, a, a lot of my uh, friends that do speak French, I mean, they're, they're like trying to search for words in English and they're like, mm, I don't know what the word is. And they're thinking in French. Mm-hmm. They're like, okay, what's the, mm-hmm. I know what I'm trying to get across, but there might not be a word for that. Um, mm-hmm. English, or the word may have, you know, English being um, such a put together language. When I mean put together, it's, it's an amalgamation of so many different languages of, of things that have a a root in latin or a root in this language or this particular thing so it's sometimes difficult um to figure out exactly you know especially because we have words that mean multiple things and you have to take into account the situation or the expression of the word or what context is the word being used in then you have to take into account um cultural aspect of the way that words are being used then on top of cultural aspect you have to take into account regional aspects of the way that words are being used. And that's all before slang. Mm-hmm. So it's just like, there's so many different ways that we communicate and you, you think in that man. So it's, it's mm-hmm. very you know. mm-hmm. Um, A thought that crossed my mind is like with language, it's, it's like we have all these different ways of saying the same thing. Like in every language, there's a word for high, but it mm-hmm. all means the same or there's a word for love or a word for sad. But it all boils back down to that sort of vibratory um, essence of all things that we were talking about. Um, and just when it comes to creating songs and adding words to music, like just being really intentional about the words that we add to certain sounds like the 808 that held such power because I feel like the sound then amplifies the intention of the word. Um, and I, I just think that that's an important topic to, to talk about because especially in music right now, I feel like we're seeing a lot of a lot of loss. We're seeing a lot of like, you know, we just we just lost takeoff of the Migos, PMB Rock, Nipsey. There's so much violence going on and I feel like do you think that the music plays a role? Like where there's so much music about like absolutely, with, absolutely. especially absolutely. Yeah. So you know, again, you know, we we are in this gray area where we want to allow our youth to grow, um, to express themselves. We don't want to stifle them of speaking on their environment, especially in hip hop. We we've grown um, you know, to be proud of, hey we needed to express ourselves because no one was talking about our problems in our environment and we need to speak about it in a real and raw way. We also have to be careful about what we put out in the universe. So if there's a drill song or just, you know, something that's just like, hey, kill your ops, my op, my op, I'm spinning the block. I mean, I'm I'm smoking on so-and-so and I'm doing, so. it's like we're continuously putting this sort of energy into the the universe and it's going to come back. And, you know, if, if we 
it's not necessarily when we say when I say drill, it's not necessarily just the style of the. I'm just using drill as an example because of, you know that's been in hip hop and in music in general before drill music. But the current state of it right now, if you're constantly just listening to, even a kid just in a suburb, um, listening to this music and that's what you constantly listen to, it's going to affect your psyche. Let alone a kid who actually lives in that environment who could possibly see the ops, quote unquote, mm -hmm. who could possibly you know. Um, is constantly thinking about this thing. And then if, if I not only put that into the universe, but then something happens and someone dies, and then there's another song made that's celebrating the death of that person and sort of making fun, um, you know, there's words like, oh, we up to score. And I'm like asking my son, like, what does that mean? And he's just like, oh, well, they're keeping score of how many people they've killed on each side. And I'm like, this is, this is beyond just reporting or this is this is just actually like detrimental because it's going to continue to, to grow and, and to keep going. So yes, do I think the music has an effect on the youth? We see it. We see, and, and, and not only is it just the fact that my generation would look at it and say, okay, well, we lost like Tupac and Big, and that was a huge thing for us because two monumental people happened. And this generation, we're looking up like we're losing so many monumental people, but we don't report on just the average Joe that every mm -hmm. day that is dying and, and their life is, is, is just as important as whatever superstar's life that was lost, you know, and, and it's, it's a full 360. It's just that these deaths make us aware that this is going on at a much, much faster rate. Um, but the amount of death that surrounds us that, that is not, you know, related to some sort of superstar is just tremendous. So, you know, it has a huge effect on us and, and it puts that sort of energy into it. And then we haven't even talked about the power of group chant. When, mm. Ooh, when, yeah. When I say group chant, it's just like I'm there in a show when we play a particular record. And if it's in the garden, there are 22,000 people who are singing the same thing back to me at the same time. They've memorized it. We're all in the same cadence. We're all in the same feeling. And if I'm putting out something that's about love or about upliftment or empowerment and everyone's singing that it's a great thing but if I'm putting out something talking about kill 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 and I'm talking about specific people and then we're all group chanting this at the mm -hmm. same time that's a huge huge problem we're putting that mm -hmm. much energy to it and now we're sort of group chanting you know across platforms to where these platforms now reach the whole world all at the same time so it becomes it becomes sort of like group chanting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because it's so true. Like, you know, whether it's at a concert or even I think about in the club, you know, you've got the speakers, we're all singing the music, you got liquor, which can be considered spirits. It's like there's all kinds of things that get um, in the mix. And it's a it's a huge thing just to be mindful of is for the average music listener and, you know, people, everyone loves music, but I don't think everyone knows the deeper layers in this way. And so it's just good to share this information and to hear it from someone like yourself, um, just so that yeah, we're going to be a natural. Again, I like to, to bring it so that people don't mystify it. But if I'm in a club and there's a song and there's, you know, a Crips on this side and Bloods on this side, and there's a song that's saying kill the Crips, that, you know, and Bloods are singing this super loud in the club, obviously it's going to evoke an emotion from the others and something's going to happen. Yeah. So it's just like, that's a practical way, and, and that doesn't have to be just necessarily in a club. That could be in a city where it's just like if a radio station is playing this song, and this song is talking about like, you know, it's dissing me and, and my organization or whatever it is, then I'm obviously going to get amped up to go do something about that and handle the situation. So, you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it becomes very dangerous as to what what can happen. But it's also a fine line that we have to walk because we have to be able to. Um, allow people to express themselves so we have to kind of get to the root where they don't need to make that sort of song or they don't feel the need to um just have that type of material and it's also a situation where you can come in with experience to say hey i know when i was your age i made whatever i wanted to make and i expressed myself and this was the result of it this is what happened like we lost a biggie and a tupac because of this so let's not repeat the same mistakes and instead of us learning from that you know, it feels like we went backwards in terms of um, just the amount that's there because we can't mentor everyone, but yet everyone has the ability now to, you know, create a song at home and upload it 
to a streaming service and then it's available to the world. And even, even if the whole world doesn't hear it, the people who you're going against hear. Mm. And that creates a, a specific problems on, on, on so many different levels that we don't know about because we're not in tune necessarily with every single situation. We just know about the big ones. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's so true. Yeah, and I, I don't know, part of me tends to be on the side of the spectrum that feels that it's a little bit by design, that that's the music that's amplified on radio waves and things like that, that like- well, it, it just, it, 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 you know, it depends on where you sit. So it's, it's I've never seen someone from say a record label be like, well, you have to do this type of music. What, mm. what a record label simply does is look at what is popular. If the most positive thing, you know, because I, I came from that era too as well, where positive music was selling. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, it got a chance to get reinforced. And then negative music now is getting a lot of attention or selling because of the fact that when something negative is going to draw your attention faster than something mm-hmm. positive. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's the same reason we slow down and look at a car crash. It's, it is the exact same reason. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look at us, us as human beings, if I was to come in and say, um, you know, hey, how are you doing? I hope you have a great day. I like your hair you know, positive comments on Instagram. You're like, oh, okay, thank you. And, you. and you hit the like button. If somebody's like, I hate you, you ugly, so much, you, you automatically just jump up. Like that negative comment got more attention than all mm-hmm. of the positive comments. And we react that way. And, and you know, we, 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 we sort of, um, it takes us a, a quick second to get angry based off something. And then it takes us a long time slower to calm down. So it's mm-hmm. like that, it's just a human emotion in, in the way that we are. So we have to be mindful of, of the negative, but also in the reverse of not allowing the negative to just kick us into um, a certain mindset. You know, you could get 40,000 likes on a photo or, you know, have all these positive comments. But as soon as one negative comment comes, it, it sort of makes you jump up and you're like, why did this person do, you know? So mm-hmm. we just have to be mindful of who we are as human beings. Yeah, 100 percent. I love that. Um Man, there's so much more. I don't I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I want to just get maybe one more question in that's shifting you can, gears. You can ask as many questions as you want. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We got a lot. We got a lot, but I'll I'll keep it limited. I wanted to see your thoughts on just the future and technology. I know we're entering into a new moment that's really exciting, bringing in music in the metaverse. Um, I know you have some cool things going on with the metaverse, collimation. Um, what are you, how are you feeling about the future and the merge of technology and music um, in the years um, to come? Yeah, it's amazing. First of all, um, Collimation is a company that I started uh, with my partner, Adrian. Um, he came to me when we were doing COVID and it was something that we wanted to do where we saw um, people that were interested in AR, people that were interested in VR and 360. So we just put it all together. So, you know, the virtual reality part is really cool because it's like, I'm a Star Trek watcher and I've always, my whole life, just always been like, well, where are we going to get to the holiday? When, when can we get to that point where, you know, and I don't know if that's going to come in my lifetime, but this is sort of the start of it. And as a scientist, you sit and you watch um, things develop over years and you know that eventually we're going to get there. Um, but then VR is one thing and then AR is another thing, um, you know, having augmented reality from, from a bunch of different ways of, of um, sales of people being able to like say you know if you're walking down the street with glasses on you know signs will pop out of stores or things that you know will let will give you directions on how to get somewhere really quickly like imagine where we don't have to like look at our phone we're looking at maps like there'll be a red line you know going down the street telling you where to turn without you having to look out of your environment um all those things are like really cool to me because i'm just a star trek kid who wants all this stuff to be there um and then 360 is really cool because it's like that's still the first time where we're like okay this is how life really is and when you jump into it you know you start to notice certain things where it's like oh it's really difficult to tell a story in this because when you're our classic filmmakers you know um they direct literally our sight our line of sight when we're watching a movie they get to say where the camera angles are when the cuts happen building suspense building all these things And traditionally, music has been the thing that adds on to that of like, if you're watching a scary movie, you know, the, you know, the scary, the slow music is going to come. And then when that action happens or happens or something happens that triggers that being in this 360, you know, 
you could create some sort of film, but you have to have a way of directing people's attention. So sound will be one of the major parts of now um, being in this immersed world. Of, you know, if we hear something go off to our left, we're gonna look to our left. We have directional sound. We know when an airplane is flying above us, we know um, what side the bee is on by hearing it buzz on one particular ear or not. You know, all of that is now being incorporated and being, you know, just just developed. Um, and you know, that that's just a beautiful thing where where you know now we are finally sort of accepting at most. Um, and it takes companies, you know, to to accept it and to push it and to develop it and to put money into development and to actually see these things come about. So you know, we, we've been here before when we had quad sound and we tried it, but it didn't really latch on. And now we're, you know, we're in the Atmos situation um, and we're trying to see if it's going to latch on. And then there's, you know, like things that are completely directional sound that will, you know, through a binary system, because we are binary human beings, we only have a left and a right ear that we can then, you know, figure out how can we do directional sound in, in just normal headphones. Um, it just opens up so much in terms of programming, in terms of people's opinion, what formats those are going to come on. You know, my last talk at AES was about setting a standard for streaming. And, you know, now we need to set a standard for Atmos and um, just so that we can have some way of delivering these things, you know, so that it's not just the wild, wild west. But this is the normal development of the way that tech works um, and we'll, we will figure it out. So it's a beautiful time. And we will, we'll, we'll figure out the best way for us to use the metaverse or um, ways that it will develop that we may not have seen that, you know, our children want to develop or these sort of um, worlds that we can get into. And, and then like a Star Trek watcher, we, we kind of go through all these scenarios to predict positive and negative. And when I say positive and negative, I mean good and bad outcomes and mm -hmm. all these things because we have to be careful about what we create. So, you know, as an, as an engineer, I preach that to all engineers that you have to think beyond just like creating this thing because your intention can be one thing. You know, the people that wanted to split an atom to get energy are scientists. They have on white lab coats. They've been doing this their whole life. They're, you know, trying to figure out what is inside that can, that can you know, give us all this energy. And someone can simply take all that research and the first thing they do with it is create a bomb. Mm -hmm. you know, like your intention wasn't to create a bomb, but your intention was just to figure out energy. So mm -hmm. the things that we create can be used by other people in ways that we didn't intend um, for those things to be, you know, to be used. There's a there's a, a late '80s movie. I can't remember the, the title of the movie right now. I'll think of it later. Where there's, a, there's like a genius college, and there's a kid that goes there, and there's this guy that lives in their closet, and they can't figure out like where this guy goes all the time. He's like this old school genius guy. I think the movie may be called Genius or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. And all during the movie, these kids are battling because their science teacher has them developing something for the military. And they're not thinking of it in that way. They're thinking, oh, I'm gonna do this thing, I'm gonna win and I'm gonna graduate. And mm -hmm. they, you know, these kids win this contest or whatever, and they win the um, they win the, the scholarship or whatever it was and get awarded. And then the old guy who lives in their closet walks up to them while they're eating um, hamburgers and he's like, sort of I think you figured out your energy problem by now and they're like yeah okay cool and they're like he's like what would you use that for mm -hmm. and they look at him and they left they're like we don't care we're graduating like let the let the engineers figure that out and he's like well maybe there already is a purpose you know like mm -hmm. they're going to use it to like start frying people from space mm -hmm. so then they go it becomes humorous but then they go and they mess it up and they you know pop they they put it to a house and make the house pop popcorn but it's a really deep lesson of you have to really pay attention to what you're creating because it could be used for so many different things. Mm, oh my God. I, I'm so glad you said that because I agree a hundred percent, especially with the metaverse. And it's just like, we already talked about the power of, of sound and, and just how that influences our reality. But when you're taking like full immersive experience, like you're seeing it, you're hearing it, add mm. in the sub pack, you're feeling it. Like playing, like whether it's playing games, like these war games where you literally feel yourself getting shot or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. um, or even just music, like listening to music in a deeper way like that, it makes it even more real. I think it's important to be mindful as these new technologies come out, um, just how they can influence us. So it's really Absolutely. cool to hear you talk about that. 
and, and just to see, you know, you, you learn. So of course, from um, computer development alone, we can see when this first started, you know, um, a, a simple, simple, simple computer um, was the size of a house, you know, like a huge, that was a huge, huge thing. Mm. And then we see the computer constantly shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink um, until we get to quantum mechanics. But there's, you know, there's always been a rule that it's going to double every three years processing power. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, we get to a point of personal computers. So it'll, you know, it becomes smaller and now it can fit on a desk. And, you know, um, now we're to a point where this device that I have, that's, that's completely like, 20 things that I used to have to carry around. So it's my phone, it's my video camera, it's my my book that I used to have everyone's phone number and address in. It's, you know, it's it's complete. Um, my mom used to get these uh, uh, Encyclopedia Britannicas, you know, like it's, it's every encyclopedia that's ever created. Like all of that information is in my phone, this side. So this phone is more powerful than the computer that was used to put a man on the moon. You know, we're literally walking around with that. So I'm saying all that for you to have the precursor to understand that eventually um, it's not going to be these like goggles around our faces. It's going to be contact lenses and there's going to be mm -hmm. little speakers that are this, you know, that are, and the sub pack is going to be something that's like can go underneath our clothes and be just touching our spine and give us that same, you know, sort of feeling. Mm -hmm. So that now what does that do if we, if we even look at and study what the internet has done to, um, you know, a generation of kids that has grown up completely with the internet. Like my generation, I'm, I'm still of that generation where I have plenty of friends who are not online. And when I say not online, like not on social media, they, 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 they're not there every day looking at their, you know, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, any of those things. They just, that, that's not part of their world. So mm -hmm. looking at a generation who consistently looks at that every day, all day, like almost uses DMs like texting, you know, like all of all of these things, we gotta eventually see what is that gonna do when they can have, you know, this on 24 hours a day. Are they gonna be paying attention in class? Are they gonna be like just trapped in this world? Is it gonna go to this dystopian thing where people literally are just like there's a movie where people don't they never leave their house? They and, mm. and all the people just become unhealthy and all they do is just sit in a chair all day and eat. And, and, and are in a whole nother universe because they can be whoever they want to be and look however they want to look. And they have a doppelganger in that universe that represents them, sort of like our 80s, you know, like none of, you know, it's, it's this long thing of what is the effect of what we're creating now on the human experience and, and, and what are we doing not only to ourselves, but to the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge. And like I said, it's really cool to just see and know that someone like you is aware of all of these things and able to educate. I know you're um, the head of, let me see, I have it right here, the I'm director the, the of director Music of, Tech. Yeah, I'm the director of the MTech program. Um, yeah. So the Rock Nation did, did, people get this confused. So what the Rock Nation school did was actually add majors uh, to Long Island University. So um, I'm on the Brooklyn campus. Um, so MTEP stands for Music Technology Entrepreneurship and Production. Um, gotcha. We actually added a sports um, management major. Um, and that's a whole other thing. And then there's a vocal major um, just for people that want to sing. So that's, that's the reason for that. But it's actually you know, majors that are underneath of Long Island University. So you still have to take your liberal arts. You, you graduate with a bachelor's degree from Long Island University. Mm, nice. Nice. Well, I, it's it's just cool to see that, you know, this, all of this other information, we already know your genius as far as, you know, on the audio engineering front and the technical front, but just as far as the sort of metaphysical and spiritual and scientific, um, just underpinnings of all this stuff. It's really cool to see and just get to hear you talk about it a little bit more. So thank you for sharing so much and just being so willing to have a dialogue around sound and the transformative power of music in this way so we appreciate it um so yeah thank you for being here thank you to our audience for listening um hopefully we will have you back at some point and maybe do a part two of this discussion because there's so much more to talk about Absolutely. um but for those of us who want to learn more about Project Immersed, you can visit our website at projectimmersed.org. Thank you to our partners, Subpack, Studio Feed, um, Reverb Ventures, and 
yeah, thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. Have a good day.